How do I? R E E. Okay. Do you want me to like really? Okay. Um. Um. It's uh right to the camera, Michael. Okay. Yeah, sure. Okay. Hi. <laughs> okay. Okay. Here we go. Ready? Take two. Okay. Right, Hi, me... I'm Jonathan Demi, and you're watching. Wait a minute. Are you sure about this? Yeah, I'm out of focus, but. Oh, okay. That's how, that's how we start every show. Okay. All right. Hang on. Hmm. Let me focus on you. Okay. I'm, I'm working. I'm getting my director ready. So All right. right. Butterflies. <laughs> I told him you're the best. Do you want to see the microphone? Yes. Yeah, sure. Well, okay. it doesn't matter. That right there is perfect. Tell me when. When. Hello, I'm Jonathan Demi, and you are watching Real Black. Have fun. Is that okay? All right. Yeah, perfect. Let's jump in. Well, we have seven cameras. And, you know, I think, thinking back, what was that all about for me, Michelle? It was all about, I, I, my big idea there was, how do you, because you can't compete with a live concert. Um, Except in one way, you can get the audience up on stage, and you can get the audience, movie audience, really intimate with the artists. And that's sort of, I've, I've thought about how when we watch a concert, we zoom in on, on something or other, and we usually zoom in, I zoom in on the singer, the guitar, the whatever's going on, the drum, all that, something, and I, and I hang there for a while. So I thought, well, that's maybe that's the way to do this, to you know, try to find the most interesting things, which inevitably will be David Byrne, for one thing, and then I've got six other interesting things. To, so it became a, a process of just trying to give, give the audience that opportunity to watch, without a bunch of edits, the most interesting thing at that moment, and to try to, try to provide that experience. And we, we started, we wanted to film the audience, too, because of this connection. What's a concert without the audience? But we found out that we had to put light on the audience in order to photograph them properly. And the more light we put on them, the first night was a total disaster. The more light we put on them, the more inhibited they were. The more inhibited they were, the more uh, insecure the band was. And, and I wound up being responsible for the worst Talking Heads performance <laughs> in the history of the band's career. So, <laughs> okay, no more audience shots. Because David wasn't happy with that at all. So um, then, then I realized that well, you know, uh, we don't really need the audience. Uh, it, there's got to be something more interesting going on on stage with all these fabulous musicians that out there, and we don't really spend too much time well, in concerts. The irony, of course, is it put us in the film, right? Because we're the audience. When we're watching it, we feel like we're there. Right? Yeah, we don't have to compete with with the ones that were there. This is for us. We never see what audience. You know, so, so that's, that's good. Do you remember what was, you said, you know, that filmmaking is sort of checking off the list of things you're worried about. Do you remember the things you were worried about when you made that film? Uh, well, I was, was worried about one ludicrous thing, which is, it would be too time consuming to recount here, but, but I had, I was, I made, I was scheduled to do Stop Making Sense as I was finishing um, uh, a movie called Swing Shift, which turned into some stuff horrendous. Uh, a struggle for control of the movie with Goldie Hawn and with the uh, studio and, and what have you. And, and they wanted all these scenes shot because Goldie had fallen madly in love with her co-star, Kurt Russell, and realized that the movie, it was crazy to have this movie be about Goldie and Christine Lackey. It could be about Goldie and, and Kurt, if only there were like 50 pages of new material. Great! <laughs> so, so they, they hired um, Robert Town, the famous author of Chinatown and various things. They hired him to write the uh, uh, new scenes. And he, I think, in turn, engaged several young writers to write the scenes for his approval. And, and this reshoot, or this additional shoot, kept getting pushed, pushed back because these awful scenes kept coming in. <laughs> and this was good for me because I had, had creative control of the movie up to and including two previews and two cuts. And I felt the picture, Swing Shift in its original form wasn't a great picture, but it was a good picture, a good solid picture with a strong feminist theme. It revealed the fact that women on the home front in World War II saved the day and made a pilot. <coughs> It was, it, was, it was good, it was really, it, it was good, it wasn't great, but it was good, and it, it, it had no possibility of becoming a romantic comedy, 
about Tolly and Kurt. Um, so what happened? What's my point here? My point is that I kept, I, I was sort of like, like, uh, you know, the new scenes, because if I, uh, uh, because I, I kept able to continue the finishing process on my version. We got our magnificent score by Bruce Langhorne, and I thought at a certain point, town's never going to come up with anything good anyway. And, and well, you was, started as you were dealing with, you were thinking your own film, you're making stop, uh, stop making sense while yeah, well, this was going well, on. Well, I was scheduled yeah. to do it, and believe it or not, the scenes finally come in, and, and they were awful. And I remember the irony is that the head of Warner Brothers at the time was Robert Daly and Terry Semmel, and we had a meeting to discuss these hideous scenes. And, and they actually, there was a moment when they, they looked up and the, the scenes, because and, and, it had to be shot next week, which P.S. was the week I was shooting Stop Making Sense. <laughs> and they go, John, these scenes are terrible. What are we going to do? I said, what are we going to do? You know, we, we shouldn't be doing this at all. So, Nevertheless, we go ahead and shoot, and, and it wound up that um, this, my days consisted of um, going out to Warner Brothers a lot and directing, <laughs> i.e. saying, action, cut, Goldie, was that okay for you? <laughs> <laughs> I've been a street about this for a long time, but I read recently that Goldie was complaining about how I messed the movie up or something, so I'm... So have at it. Yeah, so... so <laughs> And in the evening, it would be going to shoot, stop making sense. And um, they, they, all, they hated me so much, all the Warner Brothers people, what have you. And, and somebody realized that they could really mess me up by proposing that, that the shoot go longer on the second day so that I would be unable to get to um, the Pantages Theater in time to just be there when the cameras were rolling. So. At a certain point, um, this came up, and, and, and at a certain point, a little bit later, I thought, I just didn't know what to do, because if I were to leave, uh, they wouldn't be losing anything, because I wasn't really directing anything. I was just, literally, my name was upside down on the slate, all that sort of legendary stuff you hear about, and then one day you're doing it, you're putting your, your name upside down on the slate because you protest what, what you're having to do. But um, I thought, well, if I leave, then that's it. Then they can fire me. I lose control, and I'm, I, you know, all these people have done so much beautiful work to make Swing Ship. But all the, the actors and the, the composer and the camera, everything. So I, I had to fight for their work as much as, as anything else. So I can't leave, but 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 I've got to be there for the shooting. And then all of a sudden, and and it starts in an hour. And then all of a sudden, the assistant director comes over and says, "We got to pull the plug." Um, there's no more shots. Ed Harris has a terrible headache. <laughs> it seems involved Goldie and Ed. So I went, I went, I was sorry to hear that Ed had a headache, but I was like, okay. So I went racing out to the lot in a panic, just a panic. I had to drive from Burbank to Hollywood. And beautiful moment in life. I got to my car, I jumped in. And sitting in the passenger seat was Ed Harris. And he said, let's rock! <laughs> Robert Towns' plan. Um, you know, how Robert Towns could, could participate in this always amazed me.